You are listening to The Underground Subway with host David Alston, a podcast dedicated to giving you the strategies to live a free and better life. Here is David Alston. Hi, I'm David Alston, host of The Underground Subway, a podcast that is dedicated to giving you all the tools and strategies needed to live a better and more successful life. Thank you for joining this podcast in which we are always excited to join you to bring you quality and qualified guests, guests that come this way with one purpose and one intention. And that's to share with you all of the tools and experiences that they have to lead you from a life in which you are struggling and suffering and lead you to a better life, to reveal the things that you need to see. Let me tell you something. Harriet Tubman said this, I could have freed a lot more slaves if only they knew that they were slaves. They were living a life in which they didn't even realize that they were in bondage. Listen, friends, how many of us are living a life in which we have no idea that we're in bondage. We have no idea that we're living far beneath our purpose, far beneath what God has intended for us, how God has intended for us to live. That's why we're here. We have the best of the best, the best guest in the world who will come on and say to us, listen, here is a chain and here is how you remove that chain. And then at that point, it's up to you to remove the chains and to go forward. I'm super excited about my guests for this edition of the Underground Subway. Let me tell you about my guest, William Attaway. William Attaway is a leadership and executive coach for Catholic Leadership, LLC, a company he founded to help leaders to intentionally grow and thrive. He has served in local church ministry for over 25 years and is currently the lead pastor of Southview Community Church, a church in Herndon, Virginia, which, by the way, is near Washington, D.C., where he has served since 2004. He holds a Ph.D. in Old Testament with an emphasis in biblical backgrounds and archaeology, and he loves to read and speak about leadership, organizational change, and building up people and teams. His newest book is entitled Catholic Leadership, which was released January of 2022. Originally from Birmingham, Alabama, William now lives in Northern Virginia with his beautiful wife, Charlotte, and their two daughters. Welcome to the Underground Subway, Pastor Dr. William Attaway. Thank you for joining us, my friend. David, it's such an honor to be here. Thanks so much for having me on. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. And let's get right into this conversation because reading that bio, it, I'm just so curious about the things that you bring to the table that can sort of help us to be to live a better life, to help us to to reach beyond where we are and to not just live a better life for ourselves, but for our entire family, because we don't want to be free. We don't want to live a better life. We don't want to live a life full of our experiencing our goals and potentials. And yet our family, our children, our grandchildren not live that same life. So tell us, uh, Pastor uh, Add away, uh, how, how, how important is it for us as individuals to have a personal leadership, a plan? Because so many of us, we want to do better. We want to have a better life, but we think that it's just going to happen if we just snap our fingers. Is it important for us to have a plan? Absolutely. I think the old adage holds true. You know, failing to plan is planning to fail. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a plan, how do you know where you're going and how will you know when you hit the bullseye and when you don't? What I do is I help leaders to develop a plan for their own growth and for the growth of their teams. If you have a plan, you know when you're hitting it and you know when you're not. You know when you're being intentional and you know when you're not. Most people operate as though they are a victim of their circumstances or their situations. And they get to the end of their week or their month or their year, and they look back and say, wow, I guess, you know, it's just a hard year. I didn't really get things done that I wanted to get done, but you didn't have a plan. Let me help you develop a plan and then hold you accountable so that you're going to be sure to take the steps that you need to get that done. Wow, that's that's very interesting. Well, uh, I come into your office, I sit down with you, and 
I want a I want a life change. I want a change in my leadership ability. I want to change in my personal life. And I heard what you just said that failing to plan is planning to fail and I need a plan. What is, and I always use this term with during my podcast, uh, during one of the movies that I love, Philadelphia, Denzel Washington was an attorney and he asked the client a uh, witness, he said a question and he said, now explain to me like I'm a six-year-old. Mm. So explain to me like I'm a six-year-old. I'm sitting in front of you and I want to change my life. I want to change everything about me. And I heard you say that I need a plan, but explain it to me like I'm a six-year-old. What's the first thing I need to do? Okay, here I am. I've got a pen and a piece of paper. How do I create a plan? What do I do? First thing you do is you determine where you are. Where are you in relationship to where you want to be? Then you determine where do I want to be? And then you take steps to get from where you are to where you want to be. It's simply a matter of developing those steps. That's your plan. Most people don't have the self-awareness to tell you where they are. Are you a better leader than you were five years ago? Why? Most people can't answer that question. Or why not? Again, most people can't answer it. What I want to do is look at the data. Let's help you develop some metrics and some data that's going to help you know, yes, I'm growing. And here are data-driven decisions that I have made. Here are data-driven choices that I'm making in my life. This is determining the books that I read, the conferences or workshops or seminars that I attend, and the people that I'm choosing to spend time with. David, I'll tell you, the one thing that will impact your leadership journey and your success in life more than anything else is the people that you choose to spend time with. They can, they, can, they can help you move towards success or, or they can prevent it. Wow. Question. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, I, I'm enjoying this already and we just got it started. How do I, you know, I think that evaluation, if I'm incorrect, you're the expert, correct me. Evaluation is so important. How do I evaluate my inner circle? Because you mm -hmm. said that that's critical. How do I evaluate A and B? How do I, uh, there's an old term, uh, you used to use years ago called trim the fat. Yeah. Yeah. How do I evaluate it? And then how do I trim the fat in my inner circle? You know, I'm going to stay in the theme that you started with, which was, let's talk about this. Like we're kids, you know, let's okay. talk about this. Let's put the cookies on the bottom shelf where everybody can eat them <laughs> because I like the cookies on the bottom shelf. Right. I'm hungry <laughs> right now, so I don't know about that. <laughs> I won't be able to get to it. <laughs> so let's put the cookies there. Let's let's talk about this. What does it look like? How do you determine? How do you evaluate? It's simply this. Is this person, is this relationship one that is helping me move toward where I want to be? Or is it draining me and hindering me from moving to where I want to be? The the the, the easy question to ask here is, is it life giving or is it life draining? Mm -hmm. And every relationship in our lives is going to fall into one of those categories. And we have to ask the hard questions. We have to say, is this, is this a life giving relationship? Think about it this way. People in your life are typically going to fall into one of two camps, right? The life giving, the life draining, but let's make it a little simpler than that. Think about people that you know, who see the world through rose colored glasses. They are the optimists right? They look around and they see the glass is half full. There's another group, right? And these are the people who look around and they see what's wrong in life. And they want to talk about that all the time. And they see the glass is half empty. Every one of us has these people in our lives. Who are you intentionally choosing to spend the majority of your time with? Who are you allowing to speak into and over your life? In, in large part, you decide that. Here's what I know. I know that if you spend time with people who are like, oh, the world is ending, everything is terrible, it's never going to get any better, and, and the glass half empty all the time, guess what? Over time, you're going to begin to bend that way. Conversely, mm -hmm. if you spend time with people who say, you know, the glass is half full, but it's, just, it's not full yet, but it's going to be, you just wait, hold on, it's coming. Guess what? Over time, you're going to begin to bend that way. Mm -hmm. Which one is going to be more conducive to you adding value to the people around you? and you moving into the life that God has called you to live, mm -hmm. which is a life-giving mindset, and which is a life-draining mindset. You get to choose that. Wow. 
You know, uh, years ago, I, I was at a church and I, I had the privilege of speaking. And the subject that I used that day was entitled, When Loving You Is Hurting Me. Mm. I said that only to say this. Now let's get to part B. Now that I've evaluated and I've recognized that loving you is hurting me, what do I do about it? Because now I'm faced with being true to my destiny, true to my purpose versus being loyal to my relationship with you. What do I do mm -hmm. when I look around at someone close to me? It could be family. Yeah. How do we yeah. trim that fat? <laughs> mm. You know, it's not always easy, is it? No, it's Particular, not. No, particularly it's not. somebody in your, in your family like that. Right. How do you deal with that? I think you have to say, you know, there are times that I'm going to choose to spend time with people who are going to invest the positive into me. Times mm -hmm. I'm going to choose people who are going to point me in the direction where I want to go. And that may mean I limit my time, even with family sometimes. Mm -hmm. now, wow. You know, that's hard. That's hard. And and I'm not talking about your, your immediate family. I'm talking about your spouse. Like, please spend time with your spouse. That's important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about your cousin or, you know, your extended family. And sometimes those relationships can be draining. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be honest about that. And we have to own that. And I think we have to say, hey, is this is this helping me or is this hindering me? Mm -hmm. And you have, to, you have to be honest because a, a lack of honesty there is not going to help anybody. And it may be that you get the opportunity to have a conversation with that person mm -hmm. when they say, hey, why don't we hang out anymore? Why don't we spend as much time? Hey, you know, it just it just feels like something's always wrong. It just feels like that, you know, everything is everything is terrible all the time. And man, I'm, I'm trying to build my life around different values and a different focus. And I'd love for you to be a part of that, but I'm going to need you to, to to make that shift with me. Mm -hmm. And let's go together. And maybe they'll be willing to, to take a step there. Sadly, many times they're not. And that means they're going to self-select. Wow. Let me ask you this, William. Uh, we, we, we sit and we talk about evaluating where we are as we start this journey. And we can talk later, if time permits, about evaluating at the end, okay, I've reached my goals. Is it important? And if so, how important is it to have evaluation? I guess we can call it points along the way. Mm. I think evaluation is critical to growth. How, how do you know if you're growing if you're not evaluating? <laughs> I think you have, to, you have to measure and you have to have benchmarks along the way. You know, every event, everything that our team does, we're asking three questions. What went right? What went wrong? And how do we make it better next time? And these are the questions that we are consistently asking again and again and again, really no matter what we're doing. I've taken those three questions and I've applied them to my own leadership growth journey, right? As I look back over my week, each week when I do a weekly review, I'm looking back and I'm thinking through the conversations that I've had. I'm thinking through the meetings that I've had. And I think what went right and I celebrate the wins because I want to train my mind to recognize the wins and celebrate those. I think so often leaders don't do that. Then I want to think, okay, what went wrong? What are the, what are the things that I, man, I wish I could have that one back. <laughs> I wish I could redo that. We all have those moments. We all have those decisions and choices. So think through that, learn from it, and then process it with the last question. How do I make it better next time? How would I do that differently next time? And it's in that processing that we train our minds so that the next time we're in a similar situation, we're going to make a different choice because wow. we process that learning. Mm -hmm. This is true in every part of your life. This is why evaluation is so important. And sadly, when it's neglected, we don't carry that learning forward because we didn't process it. Wow. You know, that's, that's, that's so critical. Um, we talk about evaluation and we talk about our inner circle. Let's combine the two. Mm -hmm. How important is it during the evaluation process uh, for, for me to evaluate, which I often, I can tend to be a little uh, prejudiced in my evaluation. I think I'm doing better. Or is it better to be evaluated by someone outside of different person that I'm accountable to? Mm, yes. <laughs> both of those are both of those are necessary. I think it's important for you to grow in your own self-awareness and to spend the time thinking through and, and learning to be honest 
about the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I think it's also incredibly helpful to have trusted voices, and, and that's important language there, trusted voices that you allow to speak into this as well. Wow. People that you trust who understand the, the mission, the vision, the purpose, what you're trying to accomplish, who get it, who approve of that, who love you, and who want to help you get better. If all those things are true, then you want those people speaking into your life. You want mm -hmm. those people helping you to get better. Wow. Let's talk. Let's sort of uh, ease uh, uh, into another area, because if we're going to talk about evaluation, we're talking about being an effective person and leader. How important is it as a leader that we train the next generation? Um, how important is it? There's something in the business world called succession planning in sure. which we plan for someone to take over. How important is it? Does that happen? Uh, you know, uh, I, I used to do a video podcast and I would always have a can and I would open it up when I would talk about something called a can of worms. <laughs> and I've, I kind of gotten away from that, but I'm sort of hesitant now because I want to open another can of worms in this conversation. <laughs> Succession planning when it comes to leadership, do we see that happening not just in business, but in the church? Mm. Uh, not as well as it could. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Um, the, the the problem, I think, is that is that every one of us tends to to want to live in the land of, of denial and forget that one day somebody is going to sit in the chair we sit in. Somebody else is going to hold the position that we hold. None of us are going to be doing this for the next hundred years. And, mm -hmm. and we, we kind of live in the land of denial there. We don't, we don't acknowledge that. We don't operate accordingly. The truth is every one of us is an interim in what we do. If we walk into it with that perspective, that's going to help us understand how critical it is to be thinking about succession, to be thinking about the next generation. If we are not as leaders consistently investing in, pouring into other leaders to do what we do, we are missing the boat. Wow. <laughs> are we intimidated when we, I mean, <laughs> boy, this can is opening up now. Are we, <laughs> do you think that we can become intimidated by the person that we see? And I'll, I'll, I'll sort of close the can by getting very spiritual. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember reading and there was an instance when one of the greatest leaders of all time, whose name was Saul, he was a great leader. And then after a battle, when David came back, Paul, Saul was upset because the people began to celebrate David and say, well, Saul killed his thousands, David 10,000. And it says that Saul eyed David from that day forward. Mm -hmm. Do you think we have a tendency of being intimidated when we see that the next person to come along to, as you call it, occupy that seat is being celebrated? I think that tendency exists, and I think it's rooted in the insecurity of a leader. If you're not secure in who God has called you to be and how he has gifted you, then you're going to see the people around you as a threat, threat to your position, threat to your title, threat to your success, you name it. I teach leadership is a privilege and a calling. And the key to a great catalytic leader is helping helping leaders to understand that their job is to invest in and see those that they are leading succeed. When I see people succeed that I lead, if I'm lifting them up and helping them, encouraging them, helping them to achieve their goals and their dreams, that is success in leadership. Mm -hmm. And this is where insecurity gets in the way. And we see this with Saul as a great example. Saul's insecurity got in the way. He could have been the one to help equip and lift David into his role, who I mean, David would ultimately be the greatest king Israel ever had. And yet mm -hmm. his insecurity got in the way. And so we see Saul not as a great mentor leader, but instead as the opposite, as a terrible mentor leader. Right? <laughs> he literally is trying to kill the guy that he should be mentoring. And, wow. and that's, that's what insecurity will do. That's as present in the business world, in the church world, in the nonprofit world, in government, in the education realm, you name it. That insecurity is everywhere because it's part of the human condition. 
part of the sin nature. And so I think we have to acknowledge that. We have to be honest about that, but understand that God calls us to something bigger and greater. Mm -hmm. He calls us to follow the example of Jesus who poured into and invested in the 12. And then when he ascended, he said, all right, 11 of them were left. Judas was not there, but the other 11 were there. And he said, here, go, go, do what you've seen me doing. Teach, baptize, disciple, go. He wow. empowered them, he equipped them, and he sent them out. That's the model for a leader. That is what catalytic leadership looks like. And that's what I want the model for my life to be. I never want to be hindered by the success of somebody that I'm leading. I see their success as my greatest success. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm laughing. I laugh every time I get into a This is a smaller can. <laughs> In reading your bio and uh, going over your bio and seeing your history and the things that you've accomplished, I want to ask this question. Not one time. Uh, I want to ask about this word that I, I'm wondering if this plays a, a role in our not being great leaders, titles, hmm. because not one time in your bio or anything does a title appear. Hmm. How, hmm. You know, we, we struggle in our society with titles. You may be the CEO, yeah. but the title, talk to us if you can about that. I think a title can be helpful if it's descriptive. I think a title can be an incredible hindrance if it's a goal. Because if it's a goal, if once I get that title, then I'll have arrived, then I'll be, you know, all that. Okay, that's that's a terrible goal. My goal is to help other leaders to intentionally grow and thrive in their leadership at work, at home, in every part of their life. That's my goal. I want to equip and help and lift up other leaders. I want to help them get better because when a leader gets better, I love how Craig Grishel says this, when a leader gets better, everybody benefits. Everybody they lead on their team, <clears throat> everybody in their organization, all of their clients, their family, their spouse, their kids, everybody benefits when a leader gets better. This is why I've dedicated my life to helping leaders to get better, to choose, to intentionally grow and thrive. That's not a title, what I just told you. Wow. That's a mission. That's my mission. That is what I do. That is what I focus on every day. If I help other leaders to get better, to grow, to move toward their goals and be who God designed and wired and gifted them to be, then I'm hitting the bullseye of what success looks like. How much of your equipping, as you say, and, and prepare, preparation, how much of that is, uh, how much does pain, personal pain, play a factor in that? How much have you experienced any personal pain? And if so, if you can ex tell us a little bit about some of the personal pain that you've gone through, and if that contributes to our success. Mm. Boy, we don't have enough time to talk about that. <laughs> there are so many stories I could tell you. Um, pain is a part of the life of any leader. You know, the, the pain of betrayal, the pain of, of unfulfilled expectations, the pain of, of missed expectations, right? Where you thought it was going to be this, and then all of a sudden, not so much. Um, there's personal pain. You know, I, I remember um, it's about three and a half years ago, you know, my older daughter, who was 14 at the time, um, started having headaches. And we thought, oh, you know, she maybe she's developing migraines. I, I started developing migraines when I was about her age. Maybe that's what this is. So we go to the doctor and get some medicine and then go back and then go back and, and it's not getting any better. <clears throat> and and so we were we were trying to figure out what this was. Eventually, they ran some tests and a scan and discovered that she had a brain tumor on the back right side of her brain. Wow. And, you know, after surgery, they, they took it out and, and did biopsy. And three weeks later, we found out it's a very rare form of cancer. Only about 50 teenagers a year in the world are diagnosed with it. Wow. Well, I got to tell you, that was not on my agenda for 2019. I didn't expect that. I didn't see that coming. It wasn't in my plan. And that was a very painful year. To, to walk with her, to walk through that season of, of radiation, surgery and radiation, all the, all the parts of that. And that, that was not something that I wanted, desired, saw coming. It was very painful. But I'll tell you that 
God taught me so much during that season and through that season that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. We shouldn't see pain as the enemy. Pain mm -hmm. is a tool. It's a tool for learning. And sometimes we learn through pain what we would learn no other way. I will share that she's doing great. We're three and a half years after the diagnosis. The cancer has not recurred. She's doing fantastic. And she actually just went and is in her first semester at college right now. So praise God. All right. Wow. That's wonderful. So if you could leave something behind, what would you leave behind if, if you were given, you know, um, you know, years ago, I, I, I hope I'm not dating myself when I say this and showing how old I am, but years ago, and hopefully if I am dating myself, then you will say that you remember, which means you, you can date along with me. <laughs> but years ago, uh, there was a, a TV show or movie, whatever, in which a guy would find a, um, a lamp on somewhere and he'd rub the lamp and the genie would pop out and give him three wishes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. So I'm not alone. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> if we rub the lamp and we said to you, William, you can leave behind one nugget, one, one thing that you could leave behind to the next generation mm. to help them to become an effective leader or live an effective life. What would that one thing be? I think it would be the importance of a teachable spirit. That is a choice that every person gets to make every day. When I get up, my goal is to be the most teachable person in every room I'm in, virtual or in, in the physical world. I, want, I don't want anybody to be more teachable than me. I don't ever want to come across as like, well, he knows it all. He just thinks he's you know made and handed down. No, I want to be the most teachable person in the room. I want to be the person asking the questions, not mm -hmm. shutting the questions down. That is an intentional choice, and too many leaders don't make it. They think that over time, they're just going to become that. They're going to become a teachable person over time without intention. Good luck with that. That's like saying, I'm going to become a great leader without being intentional about it. I have yet to meet a person who woke up one day and said, oh, my goodness, I'm a fully mature, developed leader. How did that happen? I didn't mean for that to happen, <laughs> but here I am. Never seen that happen. Wow. The same thing is true with a teachable spirit. Developing and choosing daily to have a teachable spirit in every situation, in every conversation, in every circumstance, choosing that, I think is the greatest predictor of being a catalytic leader that makes a difference of anything I talk about. Final question. Uh, and most of my questions, those that are listening will, they, you know, one of my best friends, he listens to the podcast and he says he rolls his eyes when I start talking about the talk to me like a six-year-old because I say it every podcast or I'll ask a question. What I'm about to ask you, William, I've never asked anyone before. This is the first time I've ever asked anyone this particular question. Uh, the John Hagee, uh, Pastor John Hagee said this once, once, that if you ever really want to know about a, a man, you ever really want to know about him, take one of his children, put them in a room, close the door, just the two of you, and ask them, ask the child, assure the child that what they're going to say won't leave the four walls. Tell us about who, you're, who you see your father as. He said that child will tell you the real truth about that man. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you for the first time that I've ever asked anyone, what do you think as a man, if we took your daughter and put her in a room, and said, tell us about your father. What do you think she would say? My goodness, what a great question. You know, I think about something I heard John Maxwell say one time, which was that, that real success is when those who know you best respect you most. Wow. When those who are closest to you. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think I would hope that, that either of my daughters would say that his first commitment was to his heavenly father. His second commitment was to our mom. His third commitment was to us. And everything else came after that. Wow. That's powerful. That is powerful. That is the ultimate... Uh, 
<laughs> statement that a person can say of all of the accolades and things to, to if your child says that about you mm -hmm. then in my opinion you've succeeded in life how mm -hmm. can we get in touch with you get any materials we saw rev that you have your book came out early in the year how can we get a copy of it or get in touch with you if we want to talk to you about leadership uh, you can find me on linkedin uh, just look for william Attaway. you can go to my website it's catalyticleadership.net find out more about the coaching that I provide and stay in touch with me. I uh, started a podcast a few months ago. You can subscribe to that. I'd love to have you be a part of that. And for your listeners, David, I'd love to offer a free copy of my new book. Uh, if they go to catalyticleadershipbook.com, uh, they can, if they're willing to pay the shipping charge so I can get the book to them, we'll put a paper co paperback copy of that book in their hand. My goal is to get this book into the hands of as many leaders as possible. This is, a, this is a collection of what I have learned in my own leadership journey over the last 30 years and in coaching leaders for the last 20 plus years in so many different contexts from business to nonprofit, from entrepreneurs to military and academic and, and C-suite leaders. I want to help leaders get better. And this book contains 12 keys that are threads that I see again and again in my coaching conversations with leaders. I want people to benefit from those. I want people to take those and begin to apply them. It's written in a, in a way that feels like we're having across a table. That's how I wrote it intentionally, because I want everybody to be able to grab onto this and take it and apply it. Wow. Well, thank you so much, my friend. One final question. I said I had one last, my final question. Would you be willing to come back and we can continue this conversation in the future? Absolutely. Anytime, David. All right. All right, everyone. You heard him. <laughs> well, thank you, my friend, so much for joining us here on the Underground Subway. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule and let you know that it means so much to me and to us that uh, you would do that. And we appreciate your words of wisdom that you poured into our lives today. David, thank you so much for having me. It's just been an honor to be here, and I've loved this conversation. Thank you. Well, my friends, I hear the music playing in the background, which means that we are coming to the end of this edition of the Underground Subway. I hear the music, which means that this train is pulling into the tr station. We're pulling into Purpose Boulevard and Destiny Avenue. You have to hop off this train for this edition, but there'll be another train coming along shortly. We'll have more guests. We'll have more expertise. Listen, before you go, I want to share this thought with you that William Attaway shared with us because we need to recognize where we are and not only where we are, but we need to recognize what our goals are. We need to recognize that life has a GPS system. And in that GPS system, you need to acknowledge where you are. You need to acknowledge where you intend on going. And then that GPS system will tell you how you're going to get there, how long it's going to take, what road you're going to have to travel. All that is considered a plan. But then it's up to you to hit the go button. And when you hit the go button, the GPS system will guide you there. That's why we're here. We're here to show you this is the plan. This is what you need to do. But it's up to you to hit the go button so that you can live a better and more successful life. I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to listen to this podcast. I want to thank you, whether you're listening at work or on the treadmill or in the car, wherever you are, I appreciate your support. And hopefully, without a shadow of a doubt, I know it. So we're all living better lives. Before you go to bed tonight, I want to challenge you to do something. Find a mirror. Look yourself in the eye. Just stare at yourself. Then I want you to ask yourself a question. Look at yourself and ask this question. Today, did I do something to make this world a better place? Did I do something to work toward my destiny? Or did I simply waste another day? Think about that. You don't have any more time to waste. I'm David Austin, host of the Underground Subway, and we'll see you next time right here.